Доброго вечера, шановні колеги, пане і панове, освічені студенти. І ласкаво просимо до нашої щорічної лекції імені Стасюка. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Rory Finnan. I'm associate professor of Ukrainian studies. It's very nice to see all of you here today. Um, as many of you know, since 2003, for over 20 years, the last Friday of February was the traditional date when we held the Stasiuk Lecture, which was begun with colleagues at the University of Alberta uh, quite a long time ago. Um, it was our opportunity here at Cambridge to showcase some of the best scholarship in Ukrainian studies, some of the best scholars in Ukrainian studies. But this year, obviously, the last Friday of February has a very poignant, very tragic uh, resonance and relevance, relevance for us um, today. Um, today, we're marking, of course, uh, one year since Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine. And as much as we're paying attention to the fact that one year has transpired, it's important for all of us to recall that um, Russia's broader war of aggression against Ukraine has been going on for nine years. It began in Crimea in 2014 when airborne units and special forces popped up in Crimea with the seizure of Ukraine's sovereign territory continued uh, with an invasion by installments uh, over months and years in Donbass in Ukraine's eastern industrial regions. So this time frame is really important for us to keep in mind. This is not simply one year of aggression and war. It's been nine years. And before that, there has been, unfortunately, a tradition of epistemic aggression, uh, of an aggression towards Ukrainian literature, language, and culture that's been borne out over centuries. And to help us navigate that terrain, we have a very special guest with us this evening. Professor Vitaly Chernatsky, who's a uh, professor of Slavic languages and literatures at the University of Kansas. He's also president-elect of the Association of Slavonic, or rather Slavic, and East European and Eurasian Studies. Um, knowing the significance of this date, there is no one um, more appropriate, um, more authoritative, and more sensitive than Professor Chernetsky, who's been really a pioneer in our field of Slavic studies, and particularly Ukrainian studies, uh, for over, um, well, for many decades, let's say. Um, his scholarship, his teaching, his translations have helped move our field uh, toward new, really dynamic horizons. And I could go on for quite a long time. I have a tendency to be uh, verbose and effusive. Um, and with Vitaly, I'm tempted uh, to spend a few minutes up here. Um, but today we have a special event at 7 o'clock on King's Parade. It's a vigil to commemorate the first year of this full-scale invasion, I really want to invite those of you who can to attend. So what we'll do is finish uh, around 6.45, 6.50 to allow you to proceed to King's Parade. So Professor Chenetsky has very kindly uh, agreed to speak a little bit um, <clears throat> shorter than he had planned um, so that we have Q&A and a chance to discuss um, his talk together. So would you please join me in welcoming Professor Chenetsky to the University of Cambridge. Thank you so much uh, to Professor Finnan, or rather to Rory, who is a dear friend. And indeed, uh, when uh, Rory wrote to me saying, do you think you can present on February 24th of this year? As you can imagine, uh, this was a challenge, but um, uh, clearly is an awesome responsibility as we're all marking uh, the trauma and also the heroism of Ukrainian people, uh, the support of allies worldwide. And also, uh, therefore, uh, when thinking about what would be an appropriate topic uh, to present today, I wanted to put this in broader conceptual philosophical context because this war, this horrible war, uh, the, the aggression uh, from Russia, was also prepared through uh, matters intellectual. And it is very important for us to have a clear understanding of the origins and underpinnings and also of the remarkable transformation in uh, the world's attitude towards Ukraine and the Ukrainian people and their struggle for 
uh, asserting their dignity and independence and rightful presence um, in the family of global nations. So uh, if there is a common thread in the world's reaction to Ukraine's uh, spirited resistance to Russia's full-scale invasion since February 24th of last year, it is surprise or even astonishment. Ukraine defied expectations providing numerous examples of dignity under pressure, social initiative and organization, uh, support of the war effort, as well as aiding the displaced and the wounded. The broader Western, less alone international expert community had to admit that it knew and understood a little about Ukraine, that it had a habit of recycling uncritically absorbed stereotypes and ideological talking points, many of them of Russian imperialist origin, and in its soul searching had to admit to a history of marginalizing Ukrainian studies and of ignoring or dismissing Ukrainian voices. In other words, there was an entrenched pattern of epistemic injustice towards Ukraine. In other, uh, at the same time, the Russian military assault was prepared and accompanied by a campaign of epistemic violence against Ukraine. Um, attacking its integrity and legitimacy and denying its agency. Thus, the horrors of this war, in addition to the atrocities perpetrated by the Russian army, revealed a deep ethical and intellectual challenge affecting the very essence of academic inquiry in uh, Russian and East European studies. And this uh, lecture is in part an invitation uh, to all of us uh, in the academic community to join in the project of confronting and undoing epistemic injustice towards Ukraine and considering the broader implications um, of this much needed process through which uh, our academic field needs to go. Epistemic injustice is an area of philosophical inquiry ha that has been booming prodigiously in recent years, but it is yet to cross significantly into other areas of humanities and social science inquiry. It is situated at a cross connection between political philosophy, ethics, and epistemology. It owes its growth and development, especially to feminist philosophical inquiry, as well as to philosophers examining the questions of race. Perhaps the best known text on this topic is the 2007 book by the British philosopher Miranda Fricker, Epistemic Injustice, uh, Power and the Ethics of Knowing. But I would also mention, uh, and I in fact will look at it a little more closely later in the lecture, Jose Medina's book, The Epistemology of Resistance, Gender and Racial Oppression, Epistemic Injustice and Resistant Imaginations which mounts a friendly critique uh, and, and a polemic that augments and extends Fricker's original account. In intersectional research on the contemporary world condition, in its, it is in the post-colonial and decolonial theory that we find important initial points of cross engagement. Notably, Gayatri Chakravorty Spivak uh, in her a uh, famous uh, essay, Can the Subaltern Speak, uh, also discusses uh, epistemic violence. And Walter Mignolo, uh, another very important theorist of the decolonial, talks about uh, epistemic disobedience. So uh, therefore, you know, I, let me depart from the written topics and actually talk. I think it will be better and faster if I just go with the PowerPoint. So how do we, uh, what we defined, uh, you know, epistemic injustice and where it comes from is that the idea is, epistemology is the inquiry into how, where knowledge comes from, how it is organized, how do we proceed from not knowing to knowing something. And a very big advance happened with uh, the feminist intellectual revolution in the 1970s. So Sandra Harding, in uh, her books, The Science Question of Feminism and Whose Science, Whose Knowledge, she argued and developed what is called standpoint epistemology. And that is saying that you know we do not engage in the process of knowing or getting to know something in a vacuum 
all knowledge is, as Sandra Harding argued in response, I mean, sorry, as Donna Haraway argued in response to Sandra Harding, is situated. So it is this, within this context, we talk about then the various inequalities that can arise because of how uh, society globally is organized. And therefore, we can also talk about things like concepts of epistemic violence and epistemic disobedience. So um, a little sort of summary of the main argument of Fricker's book. So she identifies two types of what she describes as epistemic injustice, testimonial injustice and hermeneutical injustice. Testimonial injustice is when prejudice causes a hearer to give a deflated level of credibility to a speaker's word. And example uh, would be uh, the testimony of a victim of sexual assault in a sexist society or a black person's testimony in a racist society. She specifically looks at To Kill a Mockingbird and uh, how that book exemplifies that. It is caused by a prejudice in the economy of credibility. Within testimonial injustice, there is even another special case of what she calls preemptive testimonial injustice through silencing, where structures of social power do not even allow a person to speak to share their knowledge. A different side of things is what she calls hermeneutical injustice, and that is when a gap in collective interpretive resources puts someone at an unfair disadvantage when it comes to making sense of their own social experience. And an example she puts is a person experiencing sexual harassment in a culture that has not yet intellectually developed this concept. Sexual harassment is real, the person is suffering, and uh, they cannot figure out why are they so uh, traumatized by the experience. They cannot put this in words. So this is caused by structural prejudice in the economy of collective hermeneutical resources. Uh, and then, looking at these injustices, Fricka identifies corresponding virtues. The virtue of testimonial justice is when a hearer looked, understands that there is the identity prejudice, and so that the identity prejudice can influence the hearer's credibility judgment, and therefore it is detected in advance and accounted for. So we understand that there's something in society that make us be less credible towards the testimony of this particular person. And you think, why is this happening? Am I sort of deflating their credibility because of these kind of prejudices and try to correct for them? And hermeneutical justice is alertness and sensitivity to the possibility, and here I'm just quoting Fricker because she put it so you know, aptly. The difficulty one's interlocutor is having as she tries to render something communicatively intelligible is due to not its being a nonsense or her being a fool, but rather to some sort of gap in collective hermeneutical resources. The speaker is struggling with an objective difficulty and not a subjective failing. And the third type of epistemic injustice uh, following up, building up on Fricker's work was identified by uh, a colleague whom I deeply respect and to whom I actually owe my engagement with this concept, Gail Paul House Jr., who is a Wittgensteinian philosopher based at Miami University in Ohio. And I'll be mentioning another Wittgensteinian philosopher later in the lecture. So being here in Cambridge, it has thing is especially apt and appropriate and I hope Professor Wittgenstein up there is listening to us approvingly. So uh, this is Gail's article, which was published in Hypatia, a very important philosophical journal back in 2012. And uh, basically, classical epistemology looks at epistemic agent, that is, a person engaged in the process of knowing as non-social, just I or somebody out there on their own, generic and self-sufficient. And all of this just flew out the window with you know, feminist uh, revolution in academia. So feminist epistemology introduced the factor of sociality. So a knower's situatedness, 
the social position um, and the Norse interdependence, the resources, epistemic resources are by nature collective. They produce a dialectical tension. Uh, and this tension can either lead to positive things, uh, expansion of positive knowledge, but it can also create a distinct form of epistemic injustice. And this is willful hermeneutical ignorance as defined by Gail Polhouse. Uh, so this is not a thwarted epistemic agent who is not believed or cannot make sense, but rather it describes situations where marginally situated knowers actively resist epistemic de domination through interaction with other resistant knowers, but still dominantly situated knowers nonetheless continue to misunderstand and misinterpret the world. An epistemology of ignorance, as she put it, a particular pattern of localized and global cognitive dysfunctions. It's a simultaneously, as she argues, an agential and structural injustice. So, sorry for the small print, but you know I was trying to get a lot of ideas across. So, a marginally situated knower, and with all of this, I hope that we are keeping Ukrainians in mind uh, within the structure of economy of knowledge within the world, because this is the point that I'm trying to make, that uh, this is where was the position of Ukrainian studies and Ukrainian voices within global academia, within global uh, making meaning about the world, of how the world operates, how the world works, how it is organized, and what is the place of Ukraine in it. So, moving along. A marginally situated knower is uh, more likely to find gaps in the predominantly held epistemic resources uh, for what is noticeable in view of the situatedness. And this is where, and you know, we have this situation that W.E.B. Du Bois, uh, famously in the, in the African-American context, called the double consciousness of a black person in a white dominated world. But we have, as early as 1992, Oksana Zabushko, as a, uh, in her speech at the Rutgers conference, which was a follow-up to the series of Lisbon uh, conferences of the uh, Whitehead Foundation in the late 80s and the dialogue between Soviet, Central European, and Western intellectuals. Uh, uh, this is where Zabushka sort of brilliantly put it, and she actually borrowed it from the modernist Yiddish poet Jakob Gladstein, the Yiddish translator of T.S. Eliot, where basically Gladstein said, I need to know about T.S. Eliot, but T.S. Eliot does not need to know about me, but I'm marginalized. But the point is, too bad for T.S. Eliot. <laughs> so that the marginal knower has a richer experience. So this is what important to going on. And this is Sandra Harding. Being marginally situated does not lead to different knowledge. It leads to more objective knowledge. Marginally situated knowers are in a position to notice inadequacies in our epistemic resources that are more entrenched. And therefore, uh, what might happen is that we create and this experience rich new knowledge. However, dominantly situated knowers can still preemptively dismiss these epistemic resources, which could help them get to know the world in light of the marginalized situatedness. However, a, somebody from a dominant position would take the interest in how the world is viewed and revealed from marginalized experience, they can participate in what Harding called a critical standpoint. So ignorance is not something to which one is doomed because of social position, but rather something one chooses to maintain and one can very much choose not to maintain. Uh, moving on, uh, I would like to introduce the perspective of another philosopher, and this is a black feminist philosopher, Christy Dodson, who is a professor at the University of Michigan. And she, building up and in dialogue with Miranda Fricker's model, talks about the related concepts of epistemic agency and epistemic oppression. So for Dodson, 
uh, epistemic injustice, as uh, Fricker identified it, is a subset of epistemic oppression. Proceeding from the assumption, and one, when looking at it, one should proceed from the assumption that there may be other types of epistemic exclusion that have not yet been conceptualized and that can diverge from Fricker's model. So in other words, we have discovered something, but we can build on it and see. So the more we know, the more we realize that there are other things that we not know, and there may be those other exclusions. So epistemic oppression refers to persistent epistemic exclusion that hinders one's contribution to knowledge production. And she, as philosophers do, then lucidly articulates what epistemic exclusion is, which is an unwarranted infringement on the epistemic agency of knowers. And the epistemic agency is the ability to utilize persuasively shared epistemic resources within a given epistemic community in order to participate in knowledge production, and if required, the revision of those same resources. And so Fricker's, and this is where the critique and the difference happens. So Fricker's model takes the perspective of those who potentially do harm and moves away from the perspective of those who are targeted by the harm. So she, a Fricker's model is looks at the point of the white jury in To Kill a Mockingbird, as opposed to the black person speaking to the white jury. Um, so it moves away from the perspective of those who are targeted by the harm, and it tries to see how to be a good knower, how to rather than how to contend with the harm that has already been done. So Dodson, in her framework, uses a systems approach focused on epistemic agency and focuses on epistemic exclusion. And therefore, again, philosophical analysis, you do first order, second order, and third order. So first order exclusions are inconsistencies in how the system is utilized or run. So Fricker's preemptive testimonial injustice can be one of the examples of that. Second order exclusion is when a system needs to be more fully developed to facilitate epistemic agency more equitably. And Fricker's hermeneutical injustice could be an example here. But Dodson says there is also a third order exclusion when an entire system is inapt for attending to epistemic interests of particular knowers. A new epistemic system is needed and it brings into focus how epistemic system can actively and not just passively harm, and therefore a call for decolonization of our whole system of knowledge of how we engage in knowing. And of course, if one looks further, there are re other related notions that philosophers have adduced. And this is another feminist philosopher, Nora Berenstein, who teaches at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville. And she was been developing the concept of epistemic exploitation when privileged persons compel marginalized persons to produce an education or explanation about the nature of oppression they face. And this is something that I think should ring a bell to some people in the audience. So marginalized persons are manipulated to spend time and energy on this labor rather than on other pursuits that may be more beneficial for them. They are placed in a double bind, having to choose between allowing ignorance and false claims about marginalized people to go unchallenged, or providing epistemic labor with the knowledge that it is improbable that the dominantly situated knowers will engage there and, uh, and will change their understanding and may well refuse to treat their knowledge claims and ways of knowing as legitimate. A related notion of Epistemic imperialism uh, developed from the concept of cultural imperialism. Uh, and here, the political theorist Iris Marion Young is an important forerunner. Uh, that the standpoint of the privileged and their experience and standards are constructed as normal and neutral, as opposed to just being part of a dynamic system. And here, another important concept uh, by Gail Polhouse, uh, her influential article on the concept of wrongful requests to understand. And what does she mean by that? And that is basically when dominantly situated knowers ask marginally situated knowers to take on the ways of understanding that are grounded in the experiences of the dominantly situated. So, you know, a white southerner before civil rights era you know, their ignorance and their mistreatment of black people 
can, it's not necessarily the fact that it's, uh, uh, they are a bad person that they just grew up in that system and we should understand that and we should therefore by understanding it excuse it so there certainly this kind of claim cannot be advanced just because you grew up in a racist society and you internalize that racism without questioning it it does not get you off the hook so in such contexts, the call for neutrality and for understanding all sides is anything but neutral and actually can make certain sides of the situation invisible without appearing to do so. And we can proliferate. I mean, to make you know, epistemic you know, cons related concepts, there is no end, just like you know, to quote yesterday's lecture by uh, Professor Moser, uh, for those of you who were there. Uh, Merriam-Webster Dictionary discussed uh, gaslighting as the word of the year for 2022. And of course, the concept of epistemic gaslighting would appear as well. So what is gaslighting uh, comes from a uh, old you know, noir film from mid 20th century. So psychological gaslighting, classic gaslighting, is purposeful deception in order to cause another person to question their perception, memories, or judgment, ultimately leading to a psychological breakdown. And philosophers, there is also a different thing, um, a concept of epistemic gaslighting, which may, by the way, be intentional or unintentional. And that is to put out of circulation a particular way of understanding the world, one that centers the experience of the one who is gaslit. So unwarranted pressure on epistemic agents to doubt their own perception. And this is what they call dominant allies of the marginalized knowers behaving badly. So saying that you know, your marginalized knowledge is just, it's, you may be wrong. You think you're being oppressed. You're not really oppressed. You know, the world is kind and gentle. It's treating you with kid gloves. So uh, I mentioned already Jose Medina earlier. He is a Spanish philosopher now also working in the United States. And this is his book, Epistemology of Resistance. Sorry to be keeping mentioning Oxford and Cambridge. I hope you know, I will not be exiled from Cambridge after doing that. But again, he is a Wittgensteinian by training. And uh, he uh, developed the notion of epistemic insensitivity or numbness or blindness. But he says he would not want to be able, ableist. So that's why he steps away from blindness. And what he says is that overcoming active ignorance requires what he says is beneficial epistemic friction. When we understand that our old concepts might not be working, they are breaking down. And so we need to account for that. And uh, we account that through two principles, principle of acknowledgment and engagement, and the principle of epistemic equilibrium. Testimonial injustices concern not only epistemic deficits, he argues, that the oppressed subjects have to endure, but also the epistemic excesses, excessive authority and credibility, excessive self-confidence that privileged subjects can enjoy. Uh, and he proposes what he calls polyphonic contextualism as a vision of virtuous interpretive responsiveness that offers a more robust notion of epistemic responsibility with respect to hermeneutical justice. So I hope I have not overwhelmed you with all this crash course of contemporary feminist and other revisionist and marginally positioned epistemology. It is all for a reason, and it directly pertains to Ukraine. And so roadmap for changes. How do we account to, for epistemic injustice, epistemic oppression that we observe in the world, that we register? Change begins at home. So this is what Fricker says. Starting with oneself is not a bad approach. So she encourages reflexive critical awareness of the likely presence of prejudice, which should lead to active critical reflection there is no clear algorithm here, but there is a clear guiding ideal. So this is something all of us need to engage in. Uh, she also talks that we need to strive to create more inclusive hermeneutical microclimates between hearers and speakers, condu uh, con conducive to reducing the effects of hermeneutic marginalization. And then uh, Gail uh, Polhouse 
talks more about epistemic agency under oppression. So system approach, again, is crucial for understanding epistemic harm associated with colonization, among other things. So structures of oppression frame knowers from within the oppressing class as ideal capable knowers, and knowers from the oppressed class, and class here is not in a Marxist sense, but in broad, a class of knowers, a class of people, um, as less able or incapable knowers. So how do we address this testimonial injustice? Is it best to correct an individual within the system or other ways of recalibrating the system so that it cannot be misused in this fashion? And she argues that we need to shift away from solutions that rely on individuals to self-correct, which is what Fricker was advocating for, towards uh, changes that prevent testimonial exchange from being discounted based on identity prejudice. She also talks that there are being second order exclusions when those who have previously been excluded are uniquely positioned to identify gaps in the system. Individual knowers can only do so much, so uh, filling those gaps may require cooperative efforts from others who do not notice the gaps in their own epistemic system as keenly. So recognizing and addressing prior willful hermeneutical ignorance is important here. And then there is uh, this other side, there is a problem of the so-called exploitative inclusions. We call upon others, but not listening to them. Like, prove to me that racism or sexism that you experience are real. As, uh, so, you know, in Slavic language, say, prove to me that you're not a camel. You know, th these kind of unfair, you know, confrontations. And as Ukrainians, we have experienced those of us who are Ukrainian many times. Um, I've had a particularly traumatic experience uh, in my early 1920s, soon after I arrived in the United States. It was at a social event at an academic conference, a reception, when uh, a person came up to me and said, oh, I hear you're Ukrainian. I know that all Ukrainians are anti-Semites. Prove to me that you're not an anti-Semite. And my blood pressure shot up. I got right in the face. Uh, I was tongue-tied. And I just fell silent. I also happen to have lost family members in the Holocaust. The fact that Ukrainians, some Ukrainians are Jewish. I mean, uh, you know, in my case, these were you know, family relatives by marriage. But it does not make them less di distant. And it does not make their loss less relevant. So that person was commute, uh, committing this prejudgment, this epistemic harm, foreclosing things and putting this unfair a burden, and such cases are extremely important. And also, in the decolonial practices of epistemic inclusion, uh, I here would like to follow Gail and talk about what Argentinian philosopher Maria Lagona says, that, that we epistemic work is very often sort of uh, vertical. So we look at the more powerful, less powerful. She says that it should be more horizontal. It should be more embracing those around us and not necessarily thinking in terms of these power relationships. So raising awareness here is not enough, but uh, we need to focus on agents, but also focusing on agents and not on systems may very well be an oppressive epistemic system itself. So I'm almost finished. So what to do? And we come back again to feminist post-colonial thought. Chandra Talpade Mahanti and her wonderful book, Knowing Without Borders. So she proposes knowing without borders as a decolonial epistemic practice, investigating the contingent and current borders that enable and disable knowing in particular instances, and recognizing that epistemic borders we animate, we create, have effects on others, and we need to consider what changes are needed to work across or reshape these epistemic borders and work to collect, collectively to enable such shifts. Without borders does not mean ignoring borders. Borders exist and they're real, but we need to be able to work beyond them. And her solution is what she calls practicing solidarity. But very importantly, it is not a solidarity secured in advance as a basis for struggle, but struggle as the basis for building, developing solidarity. Knowledge is not assumed to be prior in advance, but it is achieved among knowers struggling together in united in resistance. 
and she calls for democratizing the learning experience. So where is Ukraine in all this? As many have said, and as Rory has said very eloquently in one of his op-ed pieces, for far too long, Ukraine has been small on people's mental maps, even though it is the largest country fully situated in Europe. We can counteract the epistemic violence that is part of the current Russian aggression in Ukraine by addressing the epistemic injustice in regards to Ukraine in our intellectual environments. We need to strive for an epistemic paradigm shift. We need to recognize and confront entrenched anti-Ukrainian prejudice. We should not approach this as a temporary problem in need of a temporary solution. Returning to a status quo ante is impossible. We need to create resources for and encourage the pursuit of studies of Ukrainian language and culture, and not only in literature. Classical music is another example of enduring problematic exclusion. How hard it is to persuade one symphony to program the work of one Ukrainian composer in this season. There have been finally changes, including here in Britain. And of course, you have Kirov Karabits here in uh, Burnham, who has been doing really, really wonderful work. You need to seek out Ukrainian readings on global, regional, comparative theoretical topics. And here again, I point to uh, Professor Finnan as an example of somebody who's been doing brilliant work. So his article in Shevchenko's Kafkaz, if you have not read it, run and read it now. Uh, Shevchenko's Kafkaz is a pioneering articulation of anti-colonial solidarity of the oppressed. It anticipates what we see in France Fanon and others a century plus later. Ukrainians are not Johnny-come-latelys. Ukrainians have been engaging in original innovative thinking that is advancing global knowledge and much of the world was just not noticing it. So noticing it discovering it makes all of us richer. It is not just doing justice to Ukrainians, it is doing justice to all of us, makes us better knowers. Uh, other example would be another thing that uh, folks here in the UK have been really contributing wonderfully to getting better known and recognized. Lesya Ukrainka is outstanding modernist uh, woman writer, a playwright and a poet. And the recent production in London, which is, I think is going to come here to Cambridge too, of Cassandra, of her feminist reinterpretation of Homer, is an outstanding, outstanding example of how Ukrainians can enrich our knowledge. Uh, Ivan Dzuba, who passed away just one year ago, so literally a couple of days before uh, the start of the full-scale invasion. His pioneering work, Internationalism or Russification, a classic dissident text from the 1960s, which is a critique of Russian imperialism from a proper Marxist perspective. So uh, it boggles my mind that there are a lot of people in the Western left who uncritically assume that the Soviet Union was good because uh, there was a binary system, and therefore Russia as a continuation of the Soviet Union is good too, and it somehow tied into Marxism? It is not. I mean, this is an aggressive, you know, imperial chauvinist intellectual project that has nothing to do with Marxism, old or new. So Zuba's brilliant Marxist critique of Russian imperialism is something, again, one should run out and read if you have not had a chance to do so before. And it has been available in English for 50 plus years. So why have some folks have not been reading it? That's a good question. Also, do not mislabel Ukrainian artists and intellectuals as a Russian, because that's another kind of exclusion that has been happening, because it's rendering them invisible. Just because certain folks were subjects of the Russian Empire, they're not automatically Russian. Just like you know, folks who were subjects of the British Empire, you know, whether they lived in the Caribbean or India or New Zealand, they are not British. So this, this, this is the kind of mistake that has been very often been made, and it has been a struggle to correct, but uh, changes are happening, but in some cases, tragically, it only happened 
after February 24th of last year. Um, listen to Ukrainian voices. Understand that the work of undoing any ignorance or unconscious bias on your part is not their burden, but yours. Be respectful and politically responsible in your inquiries to your Ukrainian friends. Do not re-traumatize them. Most importantly, practice solidarity. Thank you so much. <laughs>